Dear participants, my, my name is uh, Roman. I work as a project coordinator at Center for Civil Liberties. It is a um, Kyiv-based think tank. And in a framework of a promoting of Internet Freedom Project, we conduct various activities, which among other include educational seminars. Within, uh, within the framework of this project, we conduct 10 webinars on the subject of IP law, media law, ICT law, and other related topics. Um, if you are new to our platform, I will also uh, make a short introduction about Kyiv School of Human Rights and Democracy. Our lectures is based on the platform of Kyiv School. It is a free educational platform designed by CCL managers and researchers, and we uh, organize educational activities in Kyiv and in other regions of Ukraine and abroad. Within the school, we conduct uh, lectures, seminars, film screenings, human rights games, and uh, other uh, more cu curricular activities. The school is free and open for everybody. Uh, this school is a great opportunity for citizens to get basic human rights training and to get involved in activities as a volunteers or civil activists. And uh, for instance, today we will speak about a um, legal topic. Our topic is public service broca broadcasting system in Turkey. Uh, our lecturer today is Mr. Bulat Onder. He is IP lawyer and a lecturer at Ankara Law Faculty of Atilim University. He has extensive work experience in uh, IP law, which include uh, work for Turkish radio television uh, corporation for more than 29 years. So as a legal professional, Mr. Bulent brings his uh, experience to a classroom to, uh, for his students. And today we have this unique opportunity to hear his uh, presentation. And uh, Mr. Bulent, the floor is yours. Please uh, share your uh, PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, to be to, for this kind invitation and I'm very pleased and honored for being a part of this activity. Today uh, I'll talk about uh, public source broadcasting in general uh, and then I'll move to the current uh, system in the Turkey. How should we define the system? Uh, let me share with you the content of my presentation, actually my speech. Um, yeah. First of all, uh, we'll talk about the concept of public service broadcasting. Uh, what this concept means and uh, what are the necessities? What are the core values? What are the elements of public service broadcasting in general? And then uh, after giving this theoretical part, we'll move to public service broadcasting system in Turkey. Uh, first of all, I will give very brief information about the history of uh, PSP in Turkey, and then we'll move to legal framework and administrative structure, how TRT, Turkish Radio and Television uh, Broadcasting uh, System Corporation is financed and uh, what editorial independence means for us, I mean for TRT, and uh, then accountability. This is also a very important aspect of the issue. And finally, we'll try to make a conclusion this is public service broadcasting. This is the case in Turkey. And then how should we evaluate uh, the current system in uh, public service broadcasting system in Turkey? Uh, I'm also very curious to hear about, uh, to hear your evaluation after the explanation. Uh, as Roman uh, said that I, after graduation from law school of Ankara University, I joined the TRT, Turkish Radio and Television Corporation, and served there for 29 years, and then retired and established my own law office. And during that time, mainly I did auditing, audits, auditing, and um, worked together in European Broadcasting Union in internal audit committee, 
uh, founding uh, partner. I'm one of uh, founding partner of European Broadcasting Union's internal audit group. Uh, and I did my uh, postgraduate master's degree in Switzerland, International Academy of Broadcasting on radio and television. And uh, I began uh, my PhD in the University of Westminster. Unfortunately, because of pandemic, uh, I have some problems in terms of uh, time, uh, but uh, the first part uh, remains behind. And uh, the subject of my thesis why was is editorial independence of TRT and accountability. So it fits your agenda. Uh, and before that, I would like to share you uh, with you a view from TRT campus. This is a very broad area. And the man uh, uh, middle of the flags is Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. You may heard this, the founder of our republic. And I served at this building for more than 20 years. Then that moves to uh, history of public, uh, sorry, public service broadcasting system, what it means. Now I stop share this uh, slide and giving this explanation for you to define public service broadcasting and then what are the core elements, what are the values of public service broadcasting are. Uh, definition, uh, you know, means a statement of expressing the essential nature of something. This is definition, the definition of definition. So defining this concept is important, certainly. Uh, the reason for this is that it enables us to have a common understanding. However, defining uh, con some concepts might be problematic for various reasons. And public service broadcaster is one of them. Uh, and there is not a common understanding on definition. Uh, it, uh, the main reason for this is that it's not a precise scientific term, the public service broadcasting, and any working definition would comprise a wide range of elements. Uh, now, uh, according to academics, uh, we can define the public service broadcasting system in different ways. Uh, one approach says that by naming, by naming the stations and assigns a number of public remit tasks them. So uh, you define a system in a country, in a given country, uh, there is, imagine that there is a corporation there and it's state owned and make um, a broadcast and you name the station as public service broadcaster, then it becomes public service broadcaster. I suspect we'll come back uh, later. And another approach says that ownership is the determining criteria. For instance, in France, Italy, Spain, Poland, if a broadcaster is in public ownership, then it's called as public service media or public service broadcasters. Uh, they go on arguing that, for instance, public service broadcasting in the United Kingdom, BBC, does not only include the BBC, but privately owned and commercially run broadcaster, which have certain public remit obligation as well. So ownership cannot be the right criteria according to this approach. And in addition, uh, the scholars, international organizations, for instance, such as UNESCO, also pays attention to the issue of this concept. And according to UNESCO's definition, public service broadcasting is broadcasting made, financed, and controlled by public, for the public. It's neither commercial nor state-owned. It's free from political interference and pressure, pressure from commercial forces. Uh, this is one of my favorite definition. It's made for public, it's financed by public and controlled by public. In the light of this 
explanations. So we can conclude that there is not a widely accepted definition of public service broadcasting throughout the world, though it makes difficult to have a common understanding in fact and in practice, each country um, makes its own definition by considering its specific cultural, historical, political, and social conditions. However, what makes a system, uh, the public service broadcasting, is not the definition, is not the definition, but is whether the system meets the widely accepted requirements, essentials, core values of public service broadcasting or not. Therefore, focusing on the core values and requirements of public service broadcasting system is much more meaningful than definition. So let's move uh, these essentials, these core values. The idea of transmitting a message or a long distance, you know, goes back to ancient Greek. Uh, and broadcasting means mm, transmitting of programs to an indefinitely, indefinitely large round number of people. And traditionally, public service broadcasting is a European invention and a key cultural institution in the Europe. Uh, and after the successful broadcast in the 1920s, manufacturers immediately paid attention to establish these broadcasting stations. And depending on this unexpected interest, actually, of the entrepreneurs, it was needed to regulate and control this area. Uh, uh, public service broadcasting, a European oriented and a long history and tradition in Western Europe and was considered as a public service and entrusted to state-owned national, inst nation, uh, national institutions. But uh, there has never existed a single European model of public service broadcasting in practice throughout the history. And we have, we have uh, different types of public service broadcasting model. But it doesn't mean that the public service broadcasting system has no common principle. According to academics, according to various institutions, there are different core values. But we can uh, say that uh, uh, public service broadcasting refers to an ideal, actually. It's an ideal. And the key feature of the public service uh, broadcasting is that it serves the public, it serves the public. Public means everyone, not exclude, excluding any groups, not excluding any groups, not a particular party or government. It serves citizens, it's citizens, and it consider the people as citizens, not as consumer, and providing independent and pluralistic programming which feeds the kind of wide ranging of national uh, conversation necessary for any society to operate as a well-informed democracy. This at least is the ideal. Very uh, few public service uh, broadcasters, if any, can claim to reach that ideal and it's perfect. But it's trying and getting close, that counts. Uh, and a well-functioning uh, democracy um, requires well-informed citizens. And in this sense, public service broadcasting has a vital role, very important role. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we observe this again, the importance of uh, an independent media now is on the eyes of everyone. And what's happening there, I'll come uh, to this uh, topic again. And while taking this opportunity, I would like to say certainly uh, we are very concerned about what's uh, the ongoing on situation in Ukraine. And we are very sad and we hope as soon as possible the war is over and peace comes again and you meet with peace. And we meet again in this peaceful days. Uh, with the emergence of new technology, uh, the lines, boundaries, and between traditional and new media 
have blurred. We should accept this, and uh, we call this convergence. Convergence. Uh, uh, let's move again the essentials of public service broad uh, casting. We said that it's impossible to isolate just one European uh, public service broadcasting model because of a diverse diversity. However, uh, I said that uh, in spite of this difficulty, we have still some core values, some essentials. Uh, this core values uh, defined in declaration on the core values of public service broadcasting media uh, issued by European Broadcasting Union. And these are universal, universality. Uh, it means to reach everyone, everywhere, to be everywhere. And secondly, independence, to be trusted, in other words. And the other one is excellence, to act with integrity and professionalism. And another one is diversity, diversity, to take a pluralistic approach. And another one is accountability, to listen to the audience and engage in meaningful debate. And other one is innovation, to be a driving force for innovation and creativity. Uh, so these are our core values, universal, universality, independence, excellence, diversity, accountability, innovation. Certainly it's quite possible to increase the number of these core values, but these are core. So at this point, I'll, uh, I would like to talk about a little bit the difference between public service broadcasting and state broadcasting. Uh, as I mentioned, public service model, public service broadcasting model, sorry, is independence, independent, particularly from the government, political influences. And because of that, public service broadcasting can only survive in democratic countries. Put it differently, existence of a proper, a well-functioning public service broadcasting system in a country can be accepted as an uh, indicator of a well-established democracy. There is a direct correlation between these two. Reversely, public service model cannot exist in an authoritarian or totalitarian uh, regime. So this is uh, important. Why? Uh, this is important, uh, whether there's a public service broadcasting system in a country or a state-owned one. If the public service broadcasting is defined, the public service is for public, financed by public and controlled by public, then state broadcasting can be defined as the broadcasting model, which is controlled by the state. Even if it targeted all public, audiences and is financed by the public. So the link between public and state broadcaster is very weak, very weak. And public service broadcasters as the mouthpiece of state and accepts this without questioning. In other words, they do not expect the broadcaster independent, independent from the state. These are, uh, this is uh, state owned broadcasting. Uh, uh, this might be interesting for uh, Eastern part of the Europe, uh, depending on the transformation of the political regime into democracy, state broadcasting also transforms into public service broadcast. Uh, and the transformation uh, of broadcasting is usually linked to major political upheaval, but not always as Simit pointed out that these are very dramatic changes, but there are also windows of opportunity in stable states when broadcasting can be trans transformed. And after the collapse of communism in Central and Eastern Europe, for instance, in Poland, all the public service broadcasting ideals were also transferred. It have not taken root because of the difficulties in transforming the political system 
and the political culture and the lack of a sufficiently developed civil society. This is the observe of and the evaluation of Stepka on Poland. And he argues that the primary concern of the political parties appears to be exerting influence on public service broadcasters rather than ensuring their political independence. So failure of uh, the transformation is partly because the public service broadcasters in those countries were not set anew. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Please continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so sorry. Uh, the fa failure, I said, this transformation is partly because the public service broadcasters in, this, in these countries were not set anew. It means that they were built on the old state broadcasters. So one of the most difficult part of the transformation is to change the organizational culture, or organizational culture. Even if the constitution and the relevant laws are changed, I think this is the easier part. Unless the perception of the staff and politicians and public remain same, so the efforts for transformation will inevitably be far from satisfactory. Uh, so uh, these are the, uh, my explanation on public service broadcasting, how should we define the concept and what are the necessity, what are the course of uh, public service broadcasting. After this explanation, uh, now I'll move to the Turkish case. And now I would like to share uh, a slide with you. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you can see, yes. Yeah. In this chart or in this um, graphic, you can see uh, the periods, time periods broadcasting model in uh, Turkey. Yeah. Sorry. As you will notice from uh, this uh, table, the first radio programs in Turkey uh, begin in 1927, only four years after the fun, uh, foundation of the Turkish Republic in 1923. And launching radio broadcast was part of a nation building and modernization pro uh, project of young uh, uh, Republic, Turkish Republic. And the franchise that established and operated the radio stations was awarded a private group called Turkish Wireless Telephone Company. And the reason for this was not only the modest economic and technical conditions of the state, but also because the same was done in the same countries at that uh, time. So there was some models and we took them, this model. Uh, from the establishment of the Republic of Turkey at the end of the World War II, there was a single party regime in Turkey just after the establishment of uh, another party, the Democratic Party. Uh, they began to complain about the abuse, misuse of uh, radio in Turkey. And there was a long debates on the usage or misuse uh, of public service broadcast on radio in Turkey. Then after the military in the intervention, uh, the constitution, a new constitution uh, was made. And there was uh, an article on the constitution which says that the broadcasting would be administrated administrate in Turkey by an autonomous public body. And the autonomous status of the TRT can be answered, uh, considered as an echo of the spirit of constitution. The period of 1964 and 1971 is widely accepted as an area of autonomy, autonomy in Turkish broadcasting history. 
the necessities of the autonomy were not discussed until 1960s. We have broadcasting, uh, it begins in 1927, we came 60s, but what are the necessities of public service broadcasting, autonomy, independence, independence? These concepts were not discussed within the corporation organization. So uh, we can say that there's a lack of organizational culture. Uh, we have, uh, we had actually a legendary radio speaker called Julie de Gülzar. Uh, she said, uh, she explains this, uh, this time, uh, she says, none of us had an idea about what autonomy means. We were just saying, we were autonomous now. We were all in blues of autonomy. Therefore, autonomy had no institutional basis and there was no consensus on its meaning. By considering the time, uh, I'll pass this part very briefly. And there are uh, military interventions in Turkey and depending on these interventions, constitution changed. And this autonomous status of Turkey, Turkish Radio Television Corporation was also changed. It becomes from autonomous to impartial. So uh, when we came to 1920s, uh, uh, private or commercial broadcasters appeared in the market. And then the constitution was changed in 1993. Uh, and since then, we have uh, a dual system. It means we have public service broadcasting and we have private broadcasting uh, uh, represented by Turkish Radio and Television Corporation, and we have private uh, corporations. Uh, and today it's possible to say that it's very fragmented, very fragmented Turkish broadcasting area. There are many channels. So because of this, the shares are very modest comparing with the European uh, leading public service broadcasters. Uh, then after this brief history, let's move to legal framework. Uh, what is a legal framework, a framework in Turkey? This uh, legal framework is drawn by constitution. We have article 133. And we have also a uh, uh, Turkish Radio Television Act. And we have Broadcasting Act. Act and we have TRT's Revenues Act. So these are uh, the legal framework. And according to Article 133 of the Constitution, TRT shall be a corporate body, a corporate body, and unique in that it shall be autonomous and its broadcasts shall be impartial. According to the Constitution, TRT should be autonomous and its broadcast should be impartial. However, uh, the Constitution does not set out some uh, details how the autonomy will be implemented in practice and leaves this area to sector specific legislation and uh, then also does not provide any relevant mechanism, unfortunately, and structures for supporting this autonomous statu status. And as I mentioned, we have also, apart from the Constitution TRT Act, and we have Broadcasting Act as well, and we have a radio and television Supreme Council or the public service broadcaster. Actually, they are regulatory body and uh, top, and uh, it consists both TRT, it's responsible or it has authority both on TRT and private uh, radio and television channels and on demand services. Uh, during my PhD research, I did a lot of um, interview with uh, key stuff in TRT history. And uh, when I evaluate these interviews, I conclude that Turkish case shows that regulating the field, even at a constitutional level, does not guarantee the implementation of an autonomy in practice. There is no doubt that even if there is a comprehensive and satisfactory legislation, it will still not be enough to provide editorial independence 
unless there is a democratic uh, culture and uh, a system supports the true public service broadcasting system. And another part is that the public should consider themselves as a stakeholder of uh, public service broadcaster. Uh, we are talking about in Turkish case, Turkish Radio and Television Corporation. Unfortunately, this is not the case in Turkey. Uh, and now I, I would like to talk about the concept of remit it should be also talked um, on it. Remit uh, uh, defines uh, the services of public service broadcasting, uh, public service broadcaster in a given country. And uh, the services provided by public service broadcaster generally is determined uh, by a law or a charter. Uh, this is the case in UK, but whatever the legal basis, it presents a reconciliation between public and public service broadcaster. Therefore, the content of the document should be opened, this remit. What should be the remit mission of public service broadcaster should be. Uh, a draft should be uh, prepared and it should be shared with public. It should be open to public debate and uh, all relevant parts should express their opinions on it and then it should be concluded. If necessary, it should be subject or part of a legislation. This uh, certainly I'm talking about the idea one. And uh, we talked about um, the legal framework in Turkey and then uh, let's move to independence of public service broadcasting in Turkey, meaning uh, independence of TRT. Uh, independence is the main characteristic of uh, public service broadcasting. If you ask me uh, what is the most important one, my answer would be independence, certainly. And it has uh, various aspects. One of them is administrative one, and the other one is financial one, and finally, editorial one. Uh, administrative and financial independence can be regarded as the legal shield to guarantee the editorial independence. Put it differently, without establishing uh, the appro appropriate structures and grant granting uh, reliable, adequate and secure sources, it might be difficult to provide editorial independence. We talk about the administrative aspect, first, uh, first of all. Administrative aspect of uh, independence is mainly related to composition of the main bodies. Main bodies and the relationship between the main bodies and appointments of key staff and power of TRT to make its own decisions regarding restructuring uh, financing as well. According to Article 10 of the Turkish uh, TRT law, actually, TRT's main body are general directorate and administrative board. So we have director general and her or his deputies, and we have administrative board. Uh, the general directorate is composed of director general plus deputy director generals. And secondly, uh, and this deputy director generals directly appointed by uh, director general, so, and dismissed, certainly. Uh, and uh, we have administrative board, the highest decision making and uh, management body in the corporation is composed of director general and another six members. And these members are also appointed by directly by direct the president. Director general is also appointed by president for four years. Uh, and uh, administrative board uh, has another uh, president, not the director general. Uh, and unfortunately, it meets in every three, three months. So regularly, it means it has to actually meet uh, only four times in a year. So uh, director general has a great power over the uh, organization. Uh, uh, 
I would also uh, touch the legal status of stuff. Uh, this might be interesting for you. Uh, the TRD stuff, actually, the legal status of uh, TRT uh, as civil servants, mainly civil servants. Uh, and this status um, led to many problems over the, over the years. Uh, it means that it provides a comfort zone. So it's not possible to force these people, uh, this employee to retire before 65 years age. And considering how the broadcasting market in Turkey or in general in the world is competitive. And it's clear that in order to be able to make a difference and attract public's attention, especially the young people's attention, uh, we need creative stuff and, uh, and a different uh, approach, approach to the service. However, this is not possible with the mentality of a civil servant in Turkey. And the concept of civil uh, servant comes with many drawbacks, such as seeing working hours as limited from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., let's say, and not aiming uh, uh, efficiency, but instead working at a minimum speed to finish today at six and getting in the comfort zone uh, and of job security until uh, retirement. This is more or less the common perception of TRT stuff. And one of the former director general of the TRT in the 70s stated that one cannot be journalist and civil servant at the same time. Uh, almost 40 years, another director general uh, in 20s, beginning of the 20s, uh, complained about the legal status. And he said that broadcasting is not a job, can be done by civil servants. When working day is over, the staff leave the central building. I showed uh, you the blue, blue building, we call it blue building, uh, central building and go home like a factory work. However, the real broadcasting time, time begins after 6 p.m. Iron, ironically, the legal status of director general is also problematic. She or he is also civil servant. And if she or he is not reelected, she or he has to be appointed to another post another position by the government. So the legal status of uh, both uh, director general and uh, yeah. other stuff is very important uh, part of the issue. Uh, as we will see from this exp uh, explanation, uh, director general has great power on the uh, organization. And I think this is, uh, an important threat for editorial, editorial stuff. A broadcasting organization is very complex and demands a good understanding of the nature of communication technology as well as understanding as a creative people. Uh, the appointment of dismissal of stuff, particularly of manager is one very controversial uh, problem because whenever uh, Director General changes, depending on this change, a very key stuff also change. Um, uh, more or less, this is the situation uh, all over the Europe, but more or less. In Euro in Mediterranean country, uh, countries, unfortunately, uh, this is very common. Uh, no, I'm checking the time. Uh, I said this is the administrative uh, administrative part. Uh, another uh, aspect of the issue relationship with the regulatory authority, regulatory body. We have radio and television, Supreme Council, and uh, the relationship between TRT, public service broadcaster, and uh, Supreme Council is also very important. The problem is that this, uh, this council has authority over the public service broadcasting system. And 
on public service broadcaster. And at this point, we should uh, focus on uh, the composition of this Supreme Council. Uh, according to the Supreme Council's course, this court sh shall be administratively and financially autonomous and impartial as well, like the other thing. However, the composition of the uh, Supreme Council does not support its autonomous status. The reason is very simple because it's composed of non-members elected by the parliament. And for their election, the political parties nominate candidates twofold more in number in accordance with the rate of the number of seats in the parliament. And this means that in practice, the majority of the members of this Supreme Council are appointed by the president now. So the uh, composition of the Supreme Council does not reflect a political compromise. Com compromise sorry. Uh, uh, and the Supreme Council supervises and controls the broadcast in terms of compliance with the provision of broadcasting law and in the international treaties that the Republic of Turkey is a party to. Uh, according to Supreme Council's Broadcasting Act, we call it the principles of media services laid down in the related articles and provisions in the law regulating the commercial communications in the media service shall be applicable to Turkish radio and television corporations. So there are principles in the Broadcasting Act and TRT also is subject to, should consider in its broadcast, these principles. And the uh, Supreme Council has authority. At this point, let me say a few words about the censorship because uh, uh, prior to the air, uh, TRT has, and the other media providers, uh, has uh, authority on its broadcasts, on its programs. And TRT has its own unit, uh, directly dependent to the Director General. And on behalf of the Director General, this unit uh, comes from the broadcasting, experienced people, uh, supervise uh, the programs before the air prior uh, period. So uh, by considering the principles, the law, the constitution, so there's not another authority. But after the broadcasting, uh, Supreme Council has authority after the broadcasting. And if they identify an irregularities, and then they warn TRT, and they inform the situation, the government, TRT violate these principles but this is the only section, sanction. Uh, a few words on financial aspects. Uh, our uh, revenue, TRT's revenue comes from mainly electricity bills were coming actually because it was removed uh, from electricity bills, 2% of electricity bills and a levy on the electronic devices. Uh, there's a levy, uh, the rate is 8% uh, uh, up to 16% uh, of the, let's say, a television. You have to pay more uh, depending on the device. Uh, it may change this rate. Uh, you should uh, make an extra payment uh, for TRT. This is a sort of levy. And uh, levy plus, like uh, these two levies, meaning, uh, elect on electro, uh, electrical devices and, uh, and electricity bills uh, means 80% of the Turkish uh, radio television corporation's income comes from this too, meaning comes from direct the public, not from the state, not from the government budget, state budget. So this is, this is important. But then the president used his authority and removed the revenue coming from electricity. So 40% of the revenue has gone now. And it's very new. We'll see what will happen in very near future. Uh, but now TRT decided to take some measures, uh, approved the same budget 
as last year, for instance, this is one of the measures, and they are using their savings now, but this is a big threat, as I mentioned. Uh, we can conclude that TRT is not now, uh, at the moment, as a reliable uh, and predictable uh, revenue. So uh, we can say that we have problems in terms of administrative and financial independence. And finally, editorial aspect. Editorial aspect, as I mentioned, administrative and financial independence is necessary for supporting editorial independence. And since TRT is not administratively and financially uh, independent, so we have a problem in editorial area, editorial independence. Uh, now I'm checking the um, time. We have, I think, 10 minutes more. We, we have time. Just proceed with your uh, points. Uh, so far, it's very engaging and interesting. Thank you. Okay. And then another important issue, we talked about editorial independence as well. And editorial independence, independence actually is a um, matter of understanding, is a matter of culture. And unfortunately, uh, I can say that we have serious problems in this area because uh, since public service broadcasting in Turkey has not been considered as a public sphere, which is uh, in the case in a well-functioning democracy, TRT has always been um, unprotected against external pressures and limiting its editorial independence. And because of these reasons, the editorial staff are not accustomed to the principles of impartiality and objectivity. What's worse, and the TRT does not have editorial guidelines now. And these issues are not part of training program of journalists and producers. Uh, uh, finally, I will say a few things about the accountability, because this is also very important for public service broadcasters and directly related with independence. And, Emergence of commercial broadcasters actually in the market has resulted in the decrease of public service broadcasters, both share and income. And this changed public service broadcasters to take the audience more seriously and to justify their existence because they finance you and you have to prove that you deserve their interest. Otherwise, why should uh, pay for you? This is the matter of justification, actually. And now uh, we are not in the monopoly days. And very severe, there's very severe competition. We have rivals, we have commercials, the private channels, and they are also providing services. And you have to compete. Uh, I'm not saying completely. You have a remit. You have to fulfill some. Uh, or realize some programs, some genres. You should try, you should be innovative, but you should also compete. Um, this brings uh, us the media accountability, actually. Uh, when the accountability of public service broadcasting in Turkey is considered, it should be noted that a lack of a well-established accountability system in public service, public organizations in general is a lasting problem in uh, uh, developing countries, let's say. And accountability as perceived only as a legal issue and its important role in good governance is underestimated because it's a part of governance. And how public service broadcasting are perceived by the public is another uh, aspect of accountability. Uh, this might be interesting for you when the BBC is considered an independent report commissioned by the Department of Culture and Media Support states that. Now I'll try to read. 
yeah, I found it. The public perceives themselves as stakeholders in the BBC, but not purely because of their financial contribution through the license fee, but also through a recognition that the corporation defines their cultural experience and identity. I think this is, this is very important, but this is not the case, unfortunately, in Turkey. The public has never considered themselves as stakeholders of the TR, TRT. And we have a proverb in Turkish. Uh, it says, who pays the money will play the flute. And I'm almost sure you have the same one in Ukraine. In Turkish case, although it's the public who mainly funds the TRT through le levies uh, in electronic devices, on electronic devices, and uh, on electric civils, uh, I said. But they uh, do not consider themselves as stakeholders. And it's the government uh, that has played the flute over the years. Uh, and final words on auditing. Because uh, another aspect of the accountability is auditing. And independent audit is very important. In Turkey, we have Turkish Court of Accounts, uh, the State uh, Supervisory Council uh, under the Office of the Presidency. That these uh, supervisions are not performance-based. And these are external audits. And we have internal audit I came from. Uh, and this uh, unit directly dependent on the director general. So uh, this function, internal audit function, is not unfortunately independent. It reports to director general. Uh, and uh, the reports of the court, uh, I said the Turkish court of accounts, uh, it's presented to the Grand Assembly and uh, TRT need the goodwill of the parliament to be discharged for its accounts. Uh, so it's another important, uh, important drawback of the system. So we have uh, just five minutes. After this explanation, uh, at the, in the beginning of my speech, I uh, said that I will talk about the core essentials, the core values of public service broadcasting. I'll try to explain what the situation in Turkey, and then let's make together the evaluation. How can we define the uh, service provided by Turkey, uh, by TRT in Turkey? It's a public service broadcasting or state-owned broadcasting or in between. Uh, my evaluation, uh, Legal framework is very crucial, very important. It's a must. But only having uh, a well-designed uh, legal framework cannot be considered as a guarantee of a true well-functioning public service broadcasting system. What we need, we need an understanding. And we need a culture within the organization, within, let's say, TRT, TRT stuff should uh, have this culture. Uh, and uh, moreover, the political parties should consider this service as important. And one day they may lose their majority in the parliament, they'll be in the opposition part. And in these days, they will need a true public service broadcasting system. So all of the parties, all uh, public needs this public service broadcasting system. But the true one, true public, meaning independent public service broadcasting, we need this. Otherwise, my sincere, my sincere opinion is that we don't need a public service broadcasting or state of close to public, uh, state owned broadcasting under the control of government. Uh, these are uh, my explanations on public service broadcasting and the case in Turkey. If you have uh, any questions, I'll try to answer them. 
Mr. Bilent, thank you for your uh, presentation. It was uh, very interesting for me, and I would like to emphasize on a phrase that I heard at the beginning. You mentioned that public service broadcasting is serving people as citizens, not as a consumers, and this is a very important uh, point, because if we give uh, power only to corporation or a state, there is uh, a problem with abuse of power because uh, certain uh, population groups or certain not popular topics will be not publicly discussed, will be not bring to uh, public narratives. That's why I really hold to your quote during um, this presentation. I really um, like it. And um, we receive uh, several questions in the chat. You can um, see them. We will start in a chronological order. And the first question is um, uh, from Miss Natalia. You can, uh, if you want, you can ask it for yourself. Just uh, raise a hand and uh, speak up. Or if you feel not comfortable, I can read it aloud uh, for you. Uh, you can uh, choose. Uh, okay, I will. No, uh, you can. Yeah, yeah. I, I can read. Yeah. yeah uh, first question: Have you any? Uh, have you any broadcasting for people with mental disability? Maybe using easy language is uh, an option. I can uh, say a little bit uh, that uh, traditionally uh, public broadcasting system is uh, use, uh, for example, sign language much more often than any commercial one. This is a trend and this is uh, uh, well uh, respected in uh, public broadcasting sphere. And Mr. Bülent, uh, what is your opinion? Yeah, yeah, we have uh, broadcasting for uh, mentally disabled people and we are using sign language very often now almost all the time. Uh, and we have voice description as well. Uh, and in news, we have sign, we use sign language very often. Uh, and when uh, drama and other genres are considered, and uh, we have special broadcasting for them. Uh, actually, there is uh, an act which make it compulsory for the broadcasters. It comes from broadcasting act. This uh, obligation. Good, good. Uh, and the second uh, question is uh, from uh, Miss Akin. You can engage. Yes, thank you. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, it was a topic that I don't know before, actually, so it was kind of useful for me. Uh, I would like to ask three questions. So first, uh, my question is from the beginning of the presentation, actually. You uh, explained the UNESCO definition. And yeah. as I understood correctly, uh, you say it should be, I mean, public uh, service bro broadcasting needs to be free from politics. I yeah. find it kind of interesting, actually, because uh, being free from politics while giving some inf in uh, information can be hard or um, maybe impossible kind of uh, it, it's different than opinion to opinion but i would like to ask what's the limits uh, in the worldwide perspective mm -hmm. uh, i said if you ask me what is the most uh, essential one i would say independence from uh, politics certainly uh, for me it's out of questions uh, uh, for a person it's found in his 29 years in a public service broadcast. Uh, and uh, I was a very crucial part of this organization. So I have many observations. I have many friends from editorial staff. And still, this is the question. And I have very close relation with them. And I have very observations and I have interviews. So, uh, but in practice, this is very, very hard because it's not a matter of just uh, as I said, uh, legal framework. We have this legal framework, partly, and it's not uh, bad. We have an article in our constitution, it says TRT should be independent and its broadcast should be impartial. It's okay. But this is not the case in practice. And the reason is that uh, the relation, your relation with 
uh, governments, especially with government, because who appoints director general? Who appoints member of administrative board? And who makes the decision how you will finance? Certainly it's the government. It's out of question all, uh, all over the world. But what changes the political culture? If a political culture support the public service broadcasting, they believe in public, the importance, the existence of public service broadcasting, although they have this power, they refrain from inter intervening. This is the crucial part, I think. Uh, I know how uh, difficult to realize this idea. And that's the reason uh, why I said public service broadcasting is an idea. You can come close. And in democratic countries, uh, this is uh, an indicator, very important in indicator. If there is a well-functioning democracy, there is a well-functioning public service broadcasting. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, uh, relationship between government and public service broadcasting is very important part. And financial independence, another important part. But the organizational culture, this is the most difficult part because you can change a legislation and it may not be a big deal. You provide a consensus and then make the necessary changes. But, and it takes maybe a few weeks, a few months, but to change a culture, it takes years and years. So unfortunately, we do not have this culture, organizational culture, and this is the most difficult part. And the most distinguished um, example certainly is BBC in the, in the world for public service broadcasts. It's represent an idea. Certainly, they are, public service broadcasting is also an ideal for them. They have also challenges. I hope I gave the answers. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, and also I got my answer for the second question, but I have one more. Uh, so you also said uh, a meeting is held like three or four times in a year for the functioning of the TRT. Uh, three, about three years, actually, I said this was for administrative board. Mm -hmm. In older times, before this amendments, they meet regularly in every two weeks. This is important. Yeah. Now, just four times in a year, mm -hmm. according to Act, every three months. So I see. So also, you said uh, they can give some warnings. I would like to ask how the uh, proportion of these warnings changed uh, in a uh, in year in years especially supreme after council. the I said I said this again for supreme council supreme council has authority uh, of supervision on TRT's broadcast but after the broadcast not before uh, only TRT can do this so there is not censorship in this sense but then if TRT Sorry, if uh, Rutik identify, Rutik, we call Radio and Television Supreme Council, identify, you know, identify uh, an irregularities, they said that TRT, you violate this principle. But uh, we have same principle, but we have different sanctions. If you are a private one, then you, they apply, Supreme Council apply, uh, administrative and judiciary sanction. But if you are TRT violating the same rule, they only warn you. So this is not fair. And this is the case, especially in the during the election days, during the election periods, even if TRT violates these rules, the only sanction is to warn. I see. So obviously they are not using that much those warnings in these days, but I wonder, uh, were they using it uh, in previous years, especially before the presidential system, maybe? Were they really using it, that warning system? That's just warning systems. Certainly, the most important, the crucial periods are election periods. So, um, regularly, 
uh, it's not it might not be a big issue and especially uh, the um, current affair programs and news programs these are important for public service broadcasters and uh, these are um, uh, the most crucial genres in terms of editorial independence um, and we witnessed these violations in these programs but during election times uh, the influence the pressure of uh, political parties on trt increases so uh, we can witness this violation especially in this extraordinary or special uh, times election days Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, glad, uh, we have one more question. If you have time, I would like to ask you, what are the limits of censorship on public broadcasting? It was already touched a little bit, but can you elaborate a little more? Thank you. Sorry. Now I'm trying to follow the chat, chat part. Yeah, I will voice it. Uh, what are the limits of censorship for public broadcasting in Turkey? As, as I said, uh, there is not a censorship, actually. We have a special unit dedicated. Uh, the only function of this unit uh, to supervise the broadcast before the air. Certainly, we are not talking about the live uh, programs. Uh, they have this authority and if they detect some irregularities, then they have authority to cut some parts of these programs, but it's done within the corporation. But what's what, uh, most important part, uh, dear participants, is self-censorship. Because as a producer, as a correspondent, you feel the climate you know what will happen. So you limit yourselves and this cannot be measured. This is the most dramatical part, I think. So yes, there is not censorship, but certainly there's self-censorship and it's inevitable. Understood. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your answer. And uh, dear participants, thank you for engaging in a question and answer session. Uh, for today, the uh, seminar is um, officially over. I would like to say on behalf of Center for Civil Liberties, um, I wish you a great uh, academic career and success in your work and uh, studies. Um, we finish for today. Thank you. Thanks, you all. Well, Thank you. Hope to see you <laughs> next time. Bye. 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 Bye.